Welcome to Made by Chance. I'm Christopher and today I'm going to show you how I'm going to repair this dry bar countertop. If you saw my last video on making this dry bar and installing this dry bar countertop, which if you didn't see but you want to, you can check out this link here. Um, but in that, I basically flattened this whole slab out in the shop, got everything ready, brought it inside, installed it, and now here we are a couple weeks later and it has moved on me. So there is actually a definite bow. It's actually ripped up some of the sub layer um, on the countertop as well. So I got a lot of repair to do on the carcass as well as flattening out this slab again. So let me show you what my plans are for that. So it's pretty obvious to tell the bow, and here's the plan to fix it. So I'm going to re-wet this side. Um, I did not finish this side because originally I thought this was thoroughly dry. I did not use a moisture meter on it though. Obviously now I know this was not thoroughly dry slab. Um, so what I'm gonna do is re-wet this side, clamp it down, and try to get it as flat as I can. Um, then I'm gonna come in and take these pieces of steel strut and um, I will cut them to the width and I'm gonna cut channels to actually set this strut down in there, put some recessed uh, nut inserts in there and then bolt these struts down, uh, basically two on that half, two on this half. And hopefully once it's already kind of flattened out on its own, um, once it's flattened out on its own from re-wetting it, clamping it, getting these in will keep it to remain flat. Um, the biggest issue here is obviously this board wants to move and so we're going to try to be fighting mother nature and keeping it flat. So eventually that front side is going to get some cracks that are going to show up because mother nature is ultimately going to win on this one. But um, if I can at least get a couple years out of it, I'll feel a lot better about my money invested. So that's my plan on flattening this. Now let me show you what I'm going to do to the carcass to fix it to make sure that it's very rigid and will continue to help hold this thing flat. So my plan to actually repair the carcass is gonna to be to use this slotted angle iron, or I guess it's actually kind of like a zinc coated steel. But anyway, use this to actually help embrace all of the corners of the carcass or the top to the carcass in order to prevent them from bowing up. So what happened was we mounted that slab to all these pieces by drilling these holes putting an insert inside the bottom of the slab and then putting a bolt through the bottom of these up into the slab. These front two pieces uh, held fine, but it's this back piece that actually got pulled loose. And so what I'm gonna do is by using this, uh, the slotted angle iron, I'm actually gonna put holes through the back of the carcass and lag bolt it to the vertical pieces of the carcass that meet the floor. And then on the top, I'm gonna drill a hole through these slots and drop a bolt through it and put a nut on the bottom side to help actually hold all this together. Then once the slab is mounted back on top, if it actually wants to pull these pieces loose, it's gonna actually have to bend all these angle uh, pieces on the corners as well. And I don't think it's gonna do that very easy in combination with the strut pieces that are gonna be mounted to the bottom of it as well. So before I go into the repair, let me show you some other mistakes that I made in the process of installing the slab the first time. So the first thing you might have noticed in the last video as well as this one is I only had one side of this slab plane. This mistake was made just from a lack of experience with working with slabs, but slabs are very thick and so there's a lot of moisture that's held in the center of the slab. So if you only plane one side, what you're doing is exposing more fresh wood to the outer environment and that'll allow moisture to leave the slab from one side more than it will the other side. If I would have had both sides of the slab planed, then moisture would have left the center of the slab more evenly. With moisture leaving the plain side more than it did the non-plain side, this caused the slab to cup toward the plain side. The next mistake I made is whenever I brought it home from the cabinet shop after it was planed, I left it flat on the ground, plain side up. What I should have done instead was leave it flat on the ground, plain side down, and that would have prevented more moisture from leaving the plain side. Ideally, if I had both sides planed, I would have left it on a side, having both sides exposed to the environment, and this would have allowed moisture to leave from both sides of the slab evenly. The last thing I'll point out is there was a lot of tension bound up in this slab. 
Had I paid attention to some of the early signs, I could have actually treated this on the front end and prevented it from damaging the carcass. When wood dries slowly over time, all the different grains and fibers of the wood dry at a slightly different rate. This creates tension in the wood, but as long as that shape of the wood doesn't change, it reaches equilibrium. As soon as you change the shape of that board though, by either trimming it or planing it, you release some of that equilibrium and that tension gets exposed and it'll start to warp the board more. Whenever I was originally trimming this slab, you can see right here that this wood started to slowly peel away and bend away from the slab as I cut it. This shows that there was tension bound up in it and that piece of wood, even though it was only two inches being cut off, was slowly peeling away from the rest because of that tension. Had I noticed this early on, I could have reinforced the bottom of this slab just like I'm about to show you now and prevented the carcass from getting damaged like it did. Alright, so first things first, we needed to get the convex side of this slab re-wetted. What this is going to do is make the fibers of that side of the wood absorb that water and they're going to get kind of poofy and enlarged. And then whenever we clamp it down, they're actually going to kind of compress into a new shape. Once they compress into that new shape, as it dries, hopefully they'll hold that tension in that new shape. The way I went about this was making a pot of boiling hot water and then I soaked a bunch of different cloths in that hot water and laid them out across the back side of the slab. Once it was almost fully covered, I then went ahead and put my cauls along the slab and clamped it down to try to force it into a flatter shape. I then went over to the thermostat and jacked up the heat to above 80 degrees to help make it like a sauna so that that wood would absorb more of that water. This was a detriment to my electric bill for the month, but you know what? It was well worth it. After giving the wood fibers about six hours to soak up that water, I then loosened the calls and removed the rags and left the heat up above 80 degrees so that those wood fibers would continue to dry in their new shape. All right, so while the slab continues to dry, let me show you what I did for reinforcement for the carcass. So the first thing I did was cut down all of the slotted channel down to the sizes that I needed for all three sides. I also cut some notches to make sure that the bolts that would go through the carcass and into the bottom of the countertop wouldn't interfere with this channel. After cleaning up all the cut edges with a file, if for nothing else my own personal safety when handling these, um, it was time to finally bring these inside and get them installed. I started off by drilling pilot holes in the sides of the carcass and then inserting all the lag bolts that would hold these pieces of channel to the vertical pieces that go down from the top to the floor. And I spaced all the lag bolts approximately every six inches around the entire carcass. Next I drilled a bunch of quarter inch holes where I was going to have all the quarter inch carriage bolts that would hold the top of this channel to the top of the carcass. Lag bolts would have been a little easier than the carriage bolts since I had to actually get under the carcass in order to put a ratchet on the nuts to actually tighten the carriage bolt down. But I chose to go with a carriage bolt because of the rounded or lower profile flat cap style head uh, would protrude less from the surface of the carcass which means it would interfere less with the countertop and allow that countertop to get a little bit more snug to the carcass. All right, so I've had this slab in my shop for about two and a half weeks. Um, I've had it clamped to these calls that are help holding it flat, and I cranked the heat up in my shop to about 84 degrees. My electric bill's definitely gonna pay for it, but right now a moisture meter in the end grain is saying that it's about at 8% moisture content at the end grain. But I do know from everything I've heard, the best you can get normally at the end grain is about 6 to 8%. So we're in that range. So it should be about as dry as I'm going to be able to get it. So what I'm going to do next is take some 14 gauge metal strut and I'm going to cut it to length to where it can actually sit recessed in the bottom side of this slab and I'll cut some grooves with a router, set these in, anchor them in with some bolts and the idea would be as these calls are removed this metal strut uh, will help hold it flat. <laughs> Thank you. 
For routing the grooves for the strut, I started off by making sure I had the channel match the width of the strut, and then I started to slowly step down deeper into the slab to get the right depth so that the channel of strut was fully recessed inside the bottom of the slab. Before I started drilling the holes to set the nut certs in the bottom of the slab, I went ahead and marked my drill bit using a piece of blue painter's tape for the length of the nut certs. This way I could help make sure I didn't drill too far through the slab and actually come out the finished side of it. So when you keep in mind that this slab is trying to cup toward the top side of the slab, that means that over time as it's trying to continue to cup that direction, these strut pieces that are on the bottom, the slab is going to want to pull away from the ends of that strut, not so much in the middle. So I focused mostly on putting my anchors on the outside edges of the strut rather than in the center of the strut itself. I started off with a pilot bit drilling where I wanted each anchor to be set, trying to keep it as straight as possible and only going down about a half inch or so. This was just to help guide the bigger bit straight into the wood rather than actually walking around as I'm trying to drill a much larger hole into a solid piece of pecan, which is quite a hard piece of wood. Once I finished with all the pilot holes, I came back with the full size drill bit for these anchors and drilled to the point that the painter's tape just barely touched the bottom of the slab. To set all the nut certs, I put a little bit of finishing paste on the threads to help them just kind of go into the pecan a little bit smoother. And I did it all by hand using a socket wrench uh, to make sure that I didn't accidentally over torque it into the wood and actually split these thin channels. Once all the nut certs were set, I used quarter 20 cap screws to anchor all of the strut in and just tighten them down with a drill and we were good to go. Well, I got all the strut installed and this thing is very flat now. However, mistakes were made whenever I was setting those anchors or the nut certs uh, to hold the strut in. And I accidentally drilled two holes all the way through the slab. So now I'm gonna take some sawdust uh, since I have a bunch of shavings from, the, uh, from routing those grooves. And I'm just gonna pack these full of this pecan sawdust and um, Re-sand the whole thing, restain the whole thing, or uh, finish it with the Rubio Mono Coat, and hopefully these holes kind of blend in with the rest of the pecan and it won't be too noticeable. The process I used to fill these holes was simply layering sawdust and wood glue and packing it as tight as I could. I grabbed a quarter inch piece of dowel rod and just kind of pressed it into this hole as tight as I could until it was bulging out of the top and then I went on to the next one. When I go to resand everything, I'll sand these flush with the slab, and since these wood chips are the exact same cut of wood that I'm filling, hopefully whenever I refinish it, they'll hardly be noticeable at all. All right, so before I move on to refinishing the slab again, check this out. So this is a shot of the key that's right in the center of the slab, and if you watched my last video, I talked a little bit about the grain of these butterfly keys with reference to the grain of the slab. And even with having these grains perpendicular, you can see that this key was just sheared right along the grain, which is pretty hard to do. That means there was a lot of force pin up in this slab when it started to warp, but it just sheared it right along the grain and they just shoved that piece of wood into the wood of the slab where you can see it right there. I mentioned it briefly in the last video, but again, the finish I used here was Rubio Mono Coat, and this was in particular the pure type, and so they make uh, Rubio Mono Coat in a bunch of different colors and shades, and you can actually mix them and get different combinations, but I just really wanted the natural wood grain to pop. 
Rubio Monocoat is a two part finish. It has an oil part and a resin part. The resin part actually activates it and it takes about seven days, I believe they say, to completely cure. But after 24 hours, I was able to handle it and install it back in the house. All right, it's the next day after that last clip, and I just wanted to kind of go over how this is now that I got more light. We were installing this at the very end of the day, so it was kind of dark in here. Um, but overall, the installation went pretty smoothly. I will show you a couple things, though. The first one is, here on the back, there's a gap now that's about two and a half inches wide from this back wall. And originally, that gap was only about one to one and a quarter inches wide. So what happened was, the actual width of this slab shrunk by about an inch um, as I left it out in the shop to dry. Whenever I anchored this in, which if you saw my original video, you know how it's anchored in from the bottom, there's three holes on the underside at the front that go into nut certs in the bottom of the slab. Those all lined up fine. The middle three lined up pretty well, but the back three nut certs were actually off by about three quarters of an inch for the opening that I had drilled. So I actually had to relocate the hole in order to get the bolts in on the underside to anchor this down. The actual anchoring of this is mostly hand tight. The bolts that I'm using um, are bolts on a washer with a locking, nut, uh, locking washer in between. And so I did go ahead and tighten them a little bit to compress that locking washer, but I didn't really snug them down. Uh, that way, if it does want to continue to move, now that it's in the final location, environment's a little different than what the shop was, um, it has the ability to kind of move and those bolts and anchors kind of slide around as the slab moves a little bit. Overall though, this is very flat. The back is tight to the carcass. The front's tight to the carcass. I was actually able to remove some of the gaps that were originally there. Um, so I'm very happy with how it turned out. Um, so now it's mostly a waiting game. Let's see what happens, but I'm feeling pretty confident that we won't have to do anything again. Time will tell what will actually happen to the slab though if it continues to crack more or anything like that. So that's all I have for you for this project or this repair, I guess. Um, if you like this video, go check out my channel, subscribe, uh, hit the like button for this video, and until next time, take a chance and I guess repair something. Actually, no, I hope you don't have to repair anything. But if you do, take a chance and make the repair happen. Thanks. But wait, there's more. I totally forgot to tell you in that closing how the repairs on the drill holes that went all the way through the slab turned out. As you can see, they actually turned out pretty good, and I kind of got fortunate. They kind of just look like knots on that end of the wood because there's already some knots, so that repair did work.